everybody, welcome. Good evening. This is um, the first of a series of webinars from the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, um, Frontiers of Innovation. And today we're going to be talking about the implications of the best CLI results. A couple of sort of housekeeping things and my pants. Um, so this is a CME approved, this is a CME activity, um, a couple slides on the CME accreditation. The faculty, I'll quickly introduce everyone, Dr. Banerjee, um, interventional cardiologist who is at Baylor Scott and White, Dr. Eit, um, a vascular surgeon also at Baylor Scott and White, Dr. Lee, one of the card interventional cardiologists um, at the University, Hospital, University Hospitals in Cleveland, Dr. Kenneth Rosenfeld, who is interventional cardiologist at the MGH, Dr. Medis Shishapur, also at the University Hospitals in Cleveland, and myself, um, Dr. Tai, I'm at the Dallas VA and UT Southwestern. Um, here are our um, list of commercial support, and we graciously thank Shockwave and Abbott for sponsoring this webinar tonight. You can get CME credit for this hour of um, fun, really, um, and we'll email this out to you later. And once more, please remember to come to our annual meeting, which will be in Austin this year. So, oh, and if you want to look stuff up, you can look at the website, cviinnovations.org. So at this point, after all of this housekeeping, I'm going to turn this over for a brief overview of the best CLI trial um, and the results. Uh, and uh, Dr. Kenneth Rosenfeld is going to tell us he was one of the national PIs for the study. Um, so we're really lucky to have him talk to us tonight about the study itself and also his views on the results. First of all, I want to just thank... Um... Uh, the organizers and um, directors of CVI for the opportunity to talk about best CLI and to participate in this um, this uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, so um, I, I think it's kind of could be interesting. It could be could be fun. I hope it will be fun. Sherling, I remember her time at Mass General Hospital, and she was uh, pretty uh, one of the best vascular vascular surgical trainees we had here in a long time. So. Uh, it's fun to have you here. So let me just, uh, we all know a little bit about the background of chronic uh, limb-threatening ischemia, or CLTI. Um, it occurs in about 10 or 11% of patients with PAD, and its prevalence is rising because of the population aging and diabetes and uh, metabolic syndrome. And without proper treatment, 25% of those patients will have major amputations at one year. The mortality rate is also about 30% at uh, somewhere between one and two years. So it's incredibly... Um, a malignant uh, disease. Um, there are lots of disparities uh, in this. Uh, you know, disparities is a big thing right now, and uh, appropriately so. And there's a lot of ra racial and socioeconomic disparities in amputation rates. You know, treatment of CLTI relies on revascularization to improve limb perfusion and to pre prevent, prevent uh, above ankle amputation. And of course, infrainguinal bypass that's open versus endo. Um, are competing standards of care, although I think they're sort of complementary, and that's one of the findings of best CLI. Uh, so you can see this huge variation in treatment. This is from the, um, the VQI uh, database uh, back in 2013, but I think it's probably similar now, which is to say that at some institutions, if you go uh, with CLTI, you'll 100% chance you'll get a bypass. Uh, in other institutions, there's a 100% chance you'll, you'll get um, a, an endovascular treatment and, and, and everything in between. And there's, there's really uh, a lot of um, huge variation. So the question is which, is, which is the best first revascularization strategy? And that's the, the uh, goal of the best CLI trial. It was a prospective randomized multi-center, multi-specialty, open-label superiority, pragmatic clinical trial. That's I'm going to take that from... Uh, Alec Farber, who's my co-PI along with Matt Menard, that's his his phrase because he likes to get, he, it's a little bit wordy, but it's it's actually all true. And the goals, excuse me, the goals were to compare the clinical eff effectiveness and functional outcomes and the cost in patients with CLTI and infrainguinal PAD. So um, you had to have a, uh, a complete, uh, you had to have good inflow in order to uh, be randomized in the trial. Uh, but you had to be a candidate for both open vascular surgery and endovascular therapy in the eyes of the investigator. Um, we were sponsored by NH NHLBI, but we were also got, uh, got additional support because um, we uh, got to a point where we were running out of money. And um, uh, in order to complete the enrollment uh, and get the follow-up, uh, we, we got generous support from multiple entities listed here. 
So this was the study design. It was actually two parallel trials. Um, uh, and the you had to have CLTI that, uh, that was corroborated by hemodynamic criteria. You had to be not excessive risk for surgery in the eyes of the uh, the, the randomizing uh, investigator, and you had to be eligible for both open and endo. Um, and so the way this happened is you got a duplex of your great greater saphenous vein, uh, demonstrating whether it was patent or not, and whether it was available for a bypass. And um, this was reviewed. And uh, if you had a, a good single segment, single segment greater saphenous vein uh, that was available, you were put into cohort one, and then you were stratified based on um, a couple of different criteria, whether you had ischemic breast pain alone or tissue loss, and whether you had tibial, uh, tibial occlusive disease or no tibial occlusive disease. So the, those are the strata. And cohort two was patients who did not have a good vein and they needed an alternative co co conduit, whether that was uh, some other vein from another location or a prosthetic. Um, and, and then they were randomized one-to-one. -one. And then the, the hypothesis was that in cohort one, patients with adequate single segment uh, uh, greater saphenous vein would uh, would outperform uh, surgery would outperform endovascular therapy as a f initial approach, and the reverse was the uh, the uh, hypothesis for uh, cohort two. Um, the primary endpoint was a new one, which is major adverse limb event or male free survival, um, uh, and uh, male was was uh, d d described as above ankle amputation or a first major reintervention. Um, which was a clinically event, uh, clinically adjudicated event by the CEC, and that consisted of either a new bypass graft or a surgical interposition graft, surgical thrombectomy or thrombolysis. Um, a repeat intervention uh, uh, percutaneously was not considered to be a, a primary endpoint event, but a secondary endpoint event. Um, and if you needed a touch up of the, the of the uh, the graft, for example, at the distal anastomosis, that was also not considered to be a major adverse event. So there were safety endpoints, which are um, uh, all cause death, MI, and stroke, and these were those two were CEC adjudicated, and of course we collected all major adverse events. There were a lot of secondary endpoints, and uh, these are yet to be all sort of reviewed and and as we unpack the trial. But you can see they're hemodynamic, clinical, um, you know, the traditional amputation free survival, which uh, which had been the major endpoint of many trials, and uh, and so on. Um, I won't go into them in detail, but uh, the, uh, the 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 best CLI tri trial was a pragmatic trial. It, you, it, it was very much real world. The best treatment uh, within each strategy that was assigned could be determined by the investigator, and that person could decide what they wanted to do with the patient within that within their the randomization scheme. So that means that all standard uh, all endovascular therapies were allowed. Sorry if I went over a little bit. Thank you so much, Doctor. Rosenfeld, um, I think we'll just go to Dr. Eit now, who will talk about surgical bypass, um, and then we'll have a panel discussion after his talk. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I would just have to congratulate the, the guys that drove this thing. Uh, Dr. Rosenfeld, I know uh, Alec Farber and Matt Menard are better, but I can think of 15 years ago, listening to the struggles of trying to get this thing off the ground. And you can't, it's hard to really, you look at this and it's a publication, you think, Hey, these guys, this is easy. You just do a randomized trial and get an answer. This is trying to get a handle on this massive lump of patients and the diversity and the complexity and put together a study and continue to pursue it and pursue it and pursue it over time. I just can't emphasize my appreciation for the work that these guys did uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's monumental. It's by definition going to have lots of critics because it, it is what it is. It's a big, dirty, massive bunch of data that just took a lot of time to put together. Anyway, I just think it's fantastic. Uh, one thing I did want to make sure is that I, I know some of the audience is probably not surgeons and may not even have a clue what a saphenous vein looks like. I mean, I think for some cardiologists, and, and by all means, don't think I'm an anti cardiology vascular surgeon. I spent a lovely year doing research with Jim Willerson when I was a fellow who some of you know was uh, spent most of his career at Texas Heart. So, and I did a lot of research on uh, left main uh, disease and coronary uh, spasm and whatnot. So I have a kind of an affiliation uh, uh, on the side with cardiology, 
But the saphenous vein, as you know, is this one vein that goes from right front of the ankle up to the groin. <laughs> There's a bunch of other veins in the body and why these alternative veins wouldn't work as well as a single seg segment saphenous vein it's not entirely clear to me. Uh, there are, you know, there's anterior thigh branches you can sometimes use, there's small saphenous vein, there's arm veins, and then there's this whole array of Dacron and Gore-Tex and cadaver arteries and veins and these acellular uh, device, uh, devices that they're growing in the lab. So there's a lot of different options. You should know that there are three vein graft configurations that we typically use. The, the standard of care, I would say, started way back is a reversed vein. You take the vein out, you flip it around, and you put the small part up in the groin and the big part distally. And that size mismatch uh, sometimes can be a problem. And I don't particularly like to do reverse veins below the knee. So infrapopliteal or tibial uh, vessels, I'll almost always use some type of in situ or non-reverse translocated vein. The in situ vein was designed to be a sort of minimally invasive uh, procedure where you make a little incision in the groin, you make a little incision at the ankle, you hook the arteries and veins together on each end, and then you have to figure out a way to get rid of the valves. And there's a lot of different devices and different strategies that have been designed to do that. And you can get rid of the valves pretty quickly with uh, devices from the ankle. Then you also have to interrupt the various arteriovenous communications between the the saphenous vein and the arteries around it, uh, around the, the, the tributaries around it. And you don't have to take them all down because sometimes it's beneficial to have a few small AV communications. In fact, it's, you know, here we're doing digit, uh, distal uh, venous uh, arterialization now, trying to, in some ways, sort of backfill the, the capillaries with oxygen. How does the saphenous vein fail? Biggest problem with them is. Uh, uh, failure to completely lyse the valve. So retained valve is one mechanism of failure. The other is wound problems. These people are most of them diabetic. They've got poor circulation. A lot of them are obese. And you probably have, a, you know, there's a pretty significant issue with wound problems in lower extremity bypass. Personally, I'd like to do non-reverse translocated veins, meaning take the vein completely out flip it around and what it, the advantage is that I can see the entire vein from one end to the other. And many veins will have a bad segment that really is not, um, not really suitable and you need to cut it out. And so this idea of having a single segment of saphenous vein that's of good quality, appropriate diameter uh, and uh, accomplishes what you want it to do it's less frequent than you'd think. I mean, in my practice, it's probably about 60% of patients that I'd want to do a bypass on who have a good quality saphenous vein. Composite means we take something that's synthetic and hook it up to something that's not synthetic. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. I'll show you a couple here. So what's bad about bypass surgery? Well, to me, one of the bad things is you have heart attacks and arrhythmias. And we probably have more heart attacks and arrhythmias in peripheral bypass surgery than we do after aneurysm surgery. And certainly now that we're in the endovascular era, uh, these lower extremity bypass patients probably are at a higher risk. And, in, and as I recall, I think the numbers were actually, it, well, it wasn't statistically significant. There was more MACE in the surgery patients than in the endovascular group. Uh, again, wound problems are a significant issue. We really haven't even gone into that in this first publication, but that certainly will be something down the road that we'd like to see from the, the best uh, CLI investigators. Limb salvage versus function. This is something I think is really important to think about. When I see my friends and myself go to a meeting and I present these fem bypasses that go down to the lateral plantar artery, we congratulate each other for a patent bypass and a foot with, a, with an increased toe pressure. But can you put a shoe on and go to work is I think a very important question that we sometimes, we get uh, myopic when it comes to what our goals really are. And, and these patient-centered goals, I think is really an important issue when you start thinking about what really matters. Is limb salvage, is limb salvage really the only goal or is it functional limb salvage? The other thing I think we also need to put in the equation is the hidden cost of deconditioning that's associated with surgery. You know, it's, it's bad enough to be going back and forth to a wound care clinic for a long period of time. You lose muscle mass, you lose uh, cardiopulmonary fitness. 
And then you add to that a complex operation with wound problems that need additional uh, time to heal. And we don't really have a good way to measure that cost, but I think it's obvious in all of our experiences, we've seen patients who we say salvaged the limb, but we've really lost the war because we have a patient that doesn't have cardiopulmonary fitness and, and muscular fitness that can really benefit from the, from the salvage. I've had a couple of points about heel ulcers. <clears throat> heel ulcers rarely heal unless patients have a trajectory of recovery that is ascending. And by that, I mean, if someone develops a heel ulcer because they've had a stroke or they've had uh, some condition that's not going to improve, you can improve their circulation, but it's unlikely that the heel ulcer will improve because it's essentially a pressure sore. People who have transient causes for heel ulcers, like they have a big operation, a cardiac operation or others, and they develop a heel ulcer in the hospital, and then uh, they have a trajectory of recovery that's improving, those people with revascularization have a reasonable chance of uh, limb salvage. But so it's, I think it, it does take a little bit of subtlety to, to look at the whole patient and not just at, a, at an arteriogram or an ABI to try to decide who's going to benefit. And this last bullet point I made is not all bypasses are created equal and not all bypass surgeons are created equal. And this is actually becoming an important issue for training. I mean, I'm one of the program directors in vascular surgery and the number of bi distal bypasses that vascular surgeons in training now are performing is decreasing just like along with open aneurysm repair. And we're having to figure out novel strategies to figure out how are we gonna make sure that these vascular surgeons that are coming out they are getting lots of experience with catheters and guide wires, but uh, there is some concern that we're not effectively uh, teaching people to really perform these operations effectively. These operations are not easy. It takes a lot of time to really get one of these right, and there's lots of opportunities for failure. And this is not like taking, uh, you know, with Neo, a blue pill or a red pill. This is, uh, you know, these are complicated things, and it's easy to have a bad operation. Uh, even by even small details that haven't been uh, taken care of. I did want to show you the Mills valvular tome. It's not Joe Mills, but this is one of those old, old ways that we used to take valves out. And there's new ways that you can go in and get these valves out. And I did want you to look at vein cuffs. This is Richard Neville's really pushed this probably as much as anybody, but it's the idea of taking a PTFE graft and creating some kind of biologic interface between the artery and a, and a graft that's essentially non-compliant in order to improve its long-term performance. But I don't think anybody that actually does these for a living really believes they perform as well as vein grafts, even though some publications sort of suggest they're pretty good. Uh, in my hands, they're clearly uh, not as efficient as conventional uh, saphenous vein grafts. What did this population cohort look like? 1,400 patients. This is a pretty bad group of people. 20% had rest pain, meaning 80% had either Rutherford 5 or 6, meaning big parts of their foot was dead or they had ulcers, diabetes, and tibial disease, 10% with end-stage renal disease, not very good ABIs, and pretty darn low toe pressure. So this is not a cherry-picked group of patients. These are the real-world patients with severe limb-threatening ischemia. I would say, and I think Dr. Rosenfeld really pointed out a minute ago, these are hard patients to consent for a trial, to walk up to a patient and say, look, we have two options for you. On the one hand, we can put a needle in your left groin and you can go home later, or we can slice your whole right leg open, take out a vein, keep you in the hospital for a week. Now, which one do you want to do? And since we don't know really which one's best, we're just going to let a computer decide it's very challenging to do real informed consent and have people understand what this equipoise is and get them into the trial. And, and I think it's one of the reasons that it was challenging to the investigators to enroll as quickly as they did. There were more major reinterventions, but as pointed out, most of these primary failures in the, in the endovascular group we're, we're focused on the initial failure to cross and get back into a, 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 a patent vessel. Uh, so it's kind of like, is that really, is it, are we measuing uh, endovascular head-to-head uh, -head against successful bypass operation? Because basically, if you're going to do a bypass, it's going to succeed. You've you got to have inflow, a conduit, and outflow. Whereas here, is it, would it be better to compare a successful endovascular treatment 
to a successful operation. And I think that's been one of the you know, loud criticisms of, of best CLI. But you know, given the design of the trial, I think everybody can understand why it was designed that way. A, a question I had, and, and Dr. Rosenfeld can answer it in a minute. One of the things I was a little bit perplexed by was when you look at cohort one, the outcome, the primary outcome, this is the endovascular group, 57% reached the uh, major adverse limb events or death. And if we look at cohort two, that number was lower. And why, would, why was it lower in the second group? Is that just a numbers game because there weren't as many patients in this group? But it does kind of make you wonder why would the endovascular results not be as good in cohort two as if they, they appeared to be better in cohort two than they were in cohort one. I had a few thoughts. Suboptimal endovascular treatment is inferior to optimal surgery. And I think that's been widely sort of discussed in various chat rooms. My ultimate thought is this is clearly not either or. It's not a best treatment surgery or a best treatment endovascular. It's what's best for an individual patient with an individual problem. Catheters and knives are just tools. They're not specialty specific. And we want to pick the best tool for, for the patient. The other thing I would say just real quickly is that as a lower extremity interventionalist, you have to be a good history taker for differentiating causes of leg pain. And the Ringling brothers figured this out a long time ago and they had the three ring circus of neurologic pain, musculoskeletal pain, and circulatory pain. Not everybody that has a superficial femoral artery occlusion has circulatory pain. Some of those people have hip pain and knee pain. Some of these people have bad backs. Some of them have peripheral neuropathy. And to just say, well, I have an arteriogram that shows the blockage and it needs to be treated, I think is a, is a short-sighted view of these. And because you're gonna be on the front line treating these patients, you have to be able to differentiate causes, causes of leg pain. It's in a, impossible, in my opinion, to take care of lower extremity arterial disease without physiologic testing, which in most people's hand means an ankle brachial index and toe pressure, and to have a pretty clear idea what these, what these things mean. And yet I know even in our own hospital, we have a substantial fraction of patients who get lower extremity peripheral arterial interventions who've never had ABIs or toe pressures. The other thing I did notice in, in, the, in, in BEST that I thought was interesting was in about 20% of the patients in cohort two, that is in people who were not thought to have adequate saphenous vein by pre-op mapping, they found a good saphenous vein when they went in there. So you gotta be pretty skeptical of pre-op mapping. And I, I tell you, in our institution, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. There can be different techniques. For instance, if you stand a patient up and put a tourniquet around the thigh, you may be able to dilate a vein during the ultrasound exam and get a better result than if somebody is supine. And we don't have real perfect protocols for this in various vascular labs. So it's something to think about. Just the pre-op vein mapping may or may not tell you the whole story. And I've certainly found people that we thought did have great veins, turned out it was terrible, and other people who were just the opposite. Not everyone with CLT, CLTI loses their leg without revascularization. There's sort of this idea that it's 100% failure if we don't do something, and that's not the case. You know, wound care and other treatment strategies do have a role, not the only role, but not, it, it is important. Not everybody with CLTI loses their leg. I sometimes hear people use the term resting claudication, uh, as, and it, all it really means is it's uh, being used by somebody who doesn't know what that means. There is no such thing as resting claudication. You have rest pain in your forefoot. You have claudication is always a work-related imbalance between supply and demand. So uh, make sure you know what you're talking about when, you, when you're starting to treat peripheral arterial disease. Ulcers up on the leg are very rarely truly arterial dependent, unless you have a fully end-stage leg that's not salvageable. Diabetic neuropathy may masquerade as ischemic foot pain, and therefore toe pressures or, or TCPO2s are important. I've seen people get an advanced tibial angioplasty because the CT scan shows some calcium in the tibial vessels in a diabetic with a toe pressure of 80 and a palpable pulse. That's malpractice in my mind. That's just not understanding physiology. Now, I'm saying this a little bit facetiously. The SFA is cosmetic, but in many ways it is. The profunda is by far the most important artery in the leg when it comes to limb salvage, and sometimes it gets disrespected, and we spend a lot of time treating the SFA, and it makes a lot of sense in claudications because it's a big, you know, volume vessel, 
But in limb salvage, if you lose the profunda and the collaterals around the knee, that's where we really create problems. And it's the danger of full metal jackets. When you start stenting through the whole popliteal segment, you have a good chance you're going to interrupt the re-entry collaterals off the profunda and take somebody who didn't have a really bad problem and turn them into somebody who's got a threatened limb. And as I said, training in distal bypass is a challenge for us. So I had only a couple more sentences and it was that no two patients are alike, no surgeons are alike, no two cardiologists are alike. I try to put myself in my patient's shoes when I'm selecting a management strategy. And knowing all the stuff I know, I try to say, what would I do? And I try to take into consideration all those factors that are anatomy and physiology. And there's a lot of social factors. Where do you live? Are you the sole caregiver for your wife that's got cancer? Do you need to be at home to help her? Can you take time out to have a big operation? Uh, what is your social support around you? Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors you have to take into consideration besides something that's simply anatomical. The other thing I would say, and I would encourage all of us to feel the same way, nourish your curiosity. We're all students for life. This trial, best CLI, is not the end answer. It's the beginning of answers. And it's to be excessively critical because, well, it, you know, this uh, says surgery first and you should not do endovascular or vice versa and pitting specialties against each other. I think it's just short-sighted and silly. What we're trying to do is, is figure out the best way to take care of a very, very compromised group of patients. And again, I just want to congratulate Dr. Rosenfeld and the other, uh, the, uh, other uh, main drivers of this thing, because it's a monumental work and it's going to make all of our abilities to take care of these patients better. Thanks for that opportunity. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ice. That was I, I love, I actually, one of my favorite operations is a distal bypass, and uh, I think they're great operations, but they are a long, it's a big suck of time, um, and, but it's a great operation, and I'm sure we all have biases about them. Um, I, I don't see any questions from the audience. If, I think if anybody has questions, please type them into the chat box. I'll get to them. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one question. One thing that bothers all of us as vascular surgeons is what to do about arterial calcification. Because if you look at the supplemental data from BestCLI, there are some people who did not do, where you did not see the benefit of surgical bypass. And one of those was people with renal insufficiency. I suspect maybe because of the extensive calcification in the arteries. So Dr. Eit and Dr. Rosenfeld, Dr. Shishabor and Dr. Lee, thoughts about what to do? Like, do you think one way or the other is better in people who have extensive like SFA calcification where you look at it and you think, oh, this stent is never gonna expand. Because if you look at the best CLI data, very few people did atherectomy, right? So there is a lot, not a lot of atherectomy is probably before the time of shockwave. So, you know, these are the ones where I would personally say, no way, I'm not going to do an uh, endovascular approach. But, you know, what are your thoughts, Dr. Eit? Well, I mean, there's no good answer to that, is there? I mean, it's a great, uh, great hanging, hanging question. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's times when, it, again, it depends on the patient. What's the risk of doing a distal bypass? In some patients, it's worth taking that chance and making an effort to do an endovascular approach. So, you know, I don't, I don't have an all or none answer for you. Dr. Rosenfeld? Well, usually when I see that much calcification and, and a horrible, horrible endo case, I immediately send it to Dr. Eit. Yeah. <laughs> no, but honestly, I, I think uh, there's no easy answer. And you're right, Shockwave is a really uh, attractive, it's, it's actually turned out to be uh, better than I ever thought. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I uh, surprised myself because I was actually very involved with the development of the technology and I was kind of a skeptic early on, but uh, we're using it a lot, but uh, especially, you know, coronaries, we use it a ton uh, and, and also in the legs. I don't know that there's a right answer or wrong answer. I, I'm going to, I'm going to defer to Medi. You know, I'm going to hear what Medi and June say about that. Cause uh, you know, calcium is a, is a, is a disaster. And uh, you know, if you can find a nice sweet spot of the ankle to bypass, it's, it's, it's not a bad, not a bad option, but um, Kenny, I had one quick question for you. What did they do? Uh, if were you allowed to do tibial angioplasty in combination with a fempop bypass? No, you weren't. You were only allowed to do. Uh, that's a great question because, you, as you said, and by the way, I, I love your talk. I, 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 it's recorded. I, I think it was a fantastic, uh, you know, sort of balanced, wonderful. Uh, 
you know, seasoned talk. You can talk, you, I, and we know we're we're listening to a seasoned, really good vascular surgeon when you when I hear you. So, um, um, we it, it had to be. You had to. We had to draw the line somewhere. And hybrid things are are good. I think we do a lot of hybrid things. We actually added the hybrid, uh, the combination of doing common femoral open with and then randomizing count, counting the common femoral like an endarterectomy or profundoplasty as and your point about the profund is really really good um that um that we counted that as we allowed that into the trial you could randomize after you did the 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 the, the uh endarterectomy and so on but it was all the the infra inguinal portion had to be one or the other mm -hmm. I'm going to interrupt you for a minute because we actually have some really good audience questions. Um, and this might be a good time to ask, you know, from a practical standpoint, what is your sort of um, management? Like what is the workflow management of someone who comes into the office with uh, like CT, critical limb threatening ischemia? Like do you vein map everyone? Um, and do you vein map more people now after the best DLI results have come out? Has that changed your practice, Dr. Well, then, listen, first of all, thank you so much, you know, Dr. Rosenfeld and Dr. Eith. I agree, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Kenny, you know, your, your contribution to the trial and the enormous trial of, you know, enrolling 2,000 patients and Dr. Menard and Dr. Farber, you know, we are very grateful uh, for those of us that are committed to the field of CLTI and treating these patients. And, and I totally agree with you, Kenny, that uh, listening to Dr. Eat is very clear that he's done this a few times and mm -hmm. he's been around the block. Is uh, and that's refreshing to be honest with you because knowing the truth, let's call it in quotation, uh, is very important. You know, um, you know, for me honestly, you know, I, it hasn't really changed my practice, best CLI, uh, because uh, I always try to put the patient as a center, as Dr. Eat uh, nicely described and uh, so uh, we have always felt that you know when appropriate the patient should go for surgery and when appropriate it should be done endovascularly and the fundamental uh, challenge for me uh, in the best CLI is that were we trying to test operator experience or were we really trying to test endovascular approach and uh, that's the part that bothers me the most and just yesterday I got a text from someone uh, saying that in the local community, they are seeing a lot of failed bypasses. And what worries me is opposite of what uh, Dr. Rosenfeld and Dr. Eid suggested, that we are just, this just opened the door. People think that they found the answer. And, uh, and unfortunately, I think that people just read the headline, just like maybe me sometimes, you know, we just read the headline and don't want to uh, dive into the details and listen to these uh, our sessions and discussions and really truly understand where we are how did the data help us it did help us but how did it help us um, and and that worries me to be honest with you and that was one of the uh, reasons I wanted to participate in this session because I do think that there's a lot to learn from this trial but I also think that it would be a mistake uh, as you pointed out uh, John that you know to put specialties against each other, or to divert from the patient and think that one approach is gonna answer everything. Even the whole concept and one of the conclusion slides that, oh, endovast surgery should be the first line or endo should be the first line. I'm really against that, to be honest with you. I think the patient should be the first line and we should do what's right for the patient. So I think that, at, and I hate to talk for too much, but just to answer your question, if the patient is candidate for both, and in this study, which ran for six years, six years at over 150 sites. There were only 2,000 patients that were randomized. We do in our sites more than 2,000 patients in six years, and we are one site. So in those small group of patients that I think surgery or endo is equipoise, in my mind, which I've been doing all my career, yes, we do do vein mapping, we do consider surgery, and we do uh, refer them to surgery, like Kenny said. Listen, if somebody has very extensive calcification and we think that endo is not going to be fruitful and that beautiful tibials with no calcium uh, or nominal calcium and are good targets for bypass with good runoff, 
Of course, those patients we will send for surgery and we work collaboratively with our surgeons. But, you know, I am just worried that, you know, these are very nominal group of patients, 150 sites, six years, only 2,000 patients. As Kenny mentioned, there were a lot of patients that were not included in these trials. And we just got to understand those limitations. Thank you, Dr. Shishabor. I think um, I, I'm going to ask Dr. Lee because she's been here the whole time and she does some really, I, she does some really amazing pedal access. So if you want to, so in terms of you know complex endo and limb salvage, some of her pedal access is really quite amazing. So I'm just wondering, um, sort of along the lines of these audience questions, has this study changed your practice at all or the, the workflow management in your clinic? Uh, thanks, thanks, Shirley, for the question. Um, I'm much along the same lines as every speaker that has gone before me today. And congratulations, Kenny, for the amazing study. Um, I think we really do have to focus on the patient themselves. Um, the, you know, not every patient is the same as Dr. Eid uh, pointed out, right? There are patients that have had prior bypass for their heart and there is no venous conduit. You have to take that into consideration. Um, what the outflow truly looks like, is bypass even feasible? Um, I, this study has not per se changed my practice uh, very much. Uh, certainly, we um, I approach each patient individually, and if a patient truly would be better served by vascular surgery, open surgery, um, our colleagues are called. Um, and I I don't know that there really is. Unfortunately, there is no one right answer for everyone. It's the patient population is just so broad and so diverse that it really has to be a patient specific uh, therapy. Yes, thank you. And so there's another question, which was actually very interesting. You know, in the um, in the cohort too, without single segment stasis vein, the uh, the results of prosthetic bypass were not so bad. Like we usually tell patients, you know, two years, fifty percent uh, patency for the prosthetic bypass, but it was not as bad as we thought. Uh, Dr. Eit, are are you surprised by this? Um, oh, I'm never surprised. Um, <laughs> You know, I think one of the issues was follow-up in cohort two was only 1.6 years on median. So you, we've always known that uh, synthetic grafts, despite the fact that Frank Beats shows that he's meeting almost every year a femtib bypass that's been running into the dorsalis pedis for 42 years, uh, the reality is they tend to work pretty well for a couple of years, and then the, the, the patency curve tends to drop off pretty quick, even distal bypass with vein cuffs. So I think part of this is just an issue of relatively short uh, follow-up. Um, that would be my short answer. All right. Um, let's see. We have about 10 minutes left. Dr. Rosenfeld has a talk about uh, whether uh, endo first approach is reasonable, either, even in people with single segment saphenous vein. Um, um, I'm happy to give the talk. But I think this is actually kind of a great discussion. Uh, I, I could show a couple of slides that are actually really important, and maybe that that will help. You want to show a couple slides, and then I'm sure there are some other questions from the audience, um, and um, and then we can get to those. And then you know, I I would personally be interested. You know, Best CLI. While well, you get your slides up, Best CLI also um, collected um, quality of life data which I think, you know, everyone here has agreed that uh, we don't quite have an answer on what is the best universal approach, but I think one of the things that might come out of this is like quality of life, any quality of life data that might have come out of this. So now Dr. Rosenfeld, yours, go ahead. Yeah, so these are the questions that I, I have a whole whole slide set, but I'm just going to show a couple of things. And, you know, the specific questions you ask, you know, has it changed my practice? I, I totally am in agreement with, um, with, uh, with my two, with <laughs> with um, June Lee and and Medi, that it really hasn't changed my practice because I would send patients for bypass when I thought it was appropriate. And one of the questions is, you know, who was really enrolled in this trial? Uh, I mean, and and unfortunately, you know, the the finances of the trial did not allow us to have a core lab, and that's what I really want to know. Were were the patients who were enrolled um, really challenging, challenging endo cases where? you know, where somebody said, you know, 
it's challenging with endo. I would normally bring the patient to surgery, but why don't I enroll them a trial? I mean, have nothing to lose. And if it does, if it fails, then I'll just go to end, uh, then I'll just go to the operating room. Um, and what happened to the patients was simple, uh, straightforward endo. Were they not enrolled or were they enrolled? I, uh, my sense is that the patients that were enrolled were the more complicated endo candidates, even though they all had CLI. Um, but we don't know that, and we're trying to get to that. We hopefully will get to that with some um, additional funding from Nova Nordisk, which was very generous to give us some money to go after some of those angiograms. So the questions are, should all patients undergo open first as opposed to end up first? And the answer to that's absolutely no. I think it's, um, it's, it's very patient specific. And, you know, you have to have equipoise as, 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 as but for patients who have equipoise, and I'll, and I'll, I'll just like Medi said, if you really have equipoise and you're saying, you know, I'm not really sure that endo is the right way to go. And they, and I'm, you know, they, they got some high risk. They're, they're risky for bypass because these are patients that are really sick anyway, but it's pretty even for those patients. It actually might be that open first is the right way to go. You should certainly very much consider it. Should all patients have an evaluation for vein conduit? I can tell you that um, this in, on this, um, uh, I, <laughs> I disagree. Matt, uh, Alec, and I very much disagree about this. I actually don't believe that all patients should have um, a, uh, a conduit evaluation. It's the ones that where you have equipoise, where you think that, you know, endo is going to be pretty challenging in this patient. I don't think, you know, uh, th and maybe bypass is the right al alternative. Let's Let's check the vein. But, you know, if you have a pretty straightforward endo case, am I going to take somebody off the table and, and do a vein graft um, analysis, uh, you know, vein conduit analysis and stop the procedure? No, I don't think so. If it's pretty straightforward. Um, should all patients be evaluated by a team of endo and surgical operators? There are some people in the wake of this trial who said, well, now it looks like every patient with CLI needs to be evaluated by a surgeon first. And uh, I obviously vehemently d d disagree with that. I think that, but I do think that the team-based approach is a is a good one, and there should be collaboration. And you know, everybody on this call, on this uh, webinar, is very collaborative by fund by their by their uh, basic nature. Who's actually enrolled? How much selection bias was there? Well, we know it wasn't consecutive enrollment, as you pointed out, Medi. A very small proportion of patients at each of our sites was enrolled. So, where did the equipoise fall amongst the investigators? We don't know. What was the impact of patient-driven decisions? We don't know how many. There were more patients that said uh, that that uh, were were um, uh, crossed over and decided they didn't want to participate in the surgical group than in the endo group because they were randomized to surgery and they said, "Well, wait a second, I didn't really understand that this meant meant that I might get an operation." I mean, I, that's my sense. We don't know that for sure, but that's my sense of what happened. This is a slide from Peter Schneider created, which I think is great. And it's a challenge of equipoise and selection bias. And if it, if it you can see here, if if, if you have a uh, your fitness for for open surgery is is uh, um, you know you, this is what you'd like to uh, like to see what happens is that that you know you enroll most of the patients, even those who are pretty easy for endo get randomized, even those who are challenging, and even those who are high risk, or even those who are low risk, but. And that there's very few here that aren't enrolled. But, you know, we don't know whether that happened or with the, whether we ended up here. And I suspect we ended up here, which is the patients who were challenging for endo, who were relatively low risk for open surgery, were enrolled. We don't know for sure. Um, we, didn't, we didn't track our screen failures. There was no concurrent registry, although I argued some, uh, intensively for that. And I actually got some funding early on. We do have a registry that, that we collaborated with, um, with Duke and Viva on that is now enrolled over a thousand patients. And we'll see what, that's all comers and we'll see what that, that shows. But we, we didn't look at angiograms uh, because we didn't have them. Uh, so, Dr. Rosenfeld, uh, I'm going we'll to interrupt yeah. you for a minute because one, we're coming up to almost 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, <laughs> which is where you are. And Dr. Banerjee, who, speaking of collaboration, is one of my best collaborators, um, has a question. Um, so I, Dr. Banerjee has a question and Dr. Ait has a question. You know, I, th I think the most, uh, I think a lot of discussion about how best CLI has changed our practice, but I think the overarching premise of the trial is probably the biggest lesson for me about this, our CLCI practice. And the question is that how can we decide based on our subjective expertise and the expertise around us, what would be the best course of action for our patient? 
And I think that is a very, very hard question. And if certain expertise is not within our reach, should that patient go to a place where that expertise is possible? And I think, I think in the, all the discussions about the nitty gritty details about the study, both here and also in publication, a lot of uh, you know articles and opinion pieces. I think there needs to be a, some paradigm where a surgeon and a cardiologist can look at it, assess their capabilities, and then decide based upon other factors what would be the most optimal approach for this patient. The second part I want to also highlight from Dr. Rosenfield's presentation that we should not forget that 35% of these studies of these patients died uh, within 2.7 years. And these are centers which are creme de la creme where surgeons and cardiologists apparently were collaborating very, very closely. And you know, I'm showing work on this patient. We have seen what the mobility and mortality of these patients can be. So a lot of unmet needs and a lot of unmet tasks. And I do think that the Tower and other procedures which are done collaboratively certainly provide the paradigm how this would affect and change what we do for CRPI patients. Can I just add that you know medical therapy was grossly underutilized uh, and it improved during the course of the trial, but it was really terrible, terrible at the beginning of the trial. Uh, and a third of patients continue to smoke. Uh, you know these are really bad, bad data. We need to actually do a better job. Uh, no question about that. Okay. Well, I was going to ask real quick the question about uh, I was I was curious by the fact that there were actually more amputations in the endovascular group in cohort one, or twenty five or thirty percent. You know, the absolute risk reduction was low, but the, you know there was a significant number of more amputations, and I wondered because we generally had the feeling that if you did judicious endovascular uh, intervention as your primary option, as your first option, if you could be thoughtful about what you were doing and not burn bridges, you wouldn't wind up with amputations. And I think it, one of the things that has concerned me about the trial was, I think it, it could be just the opposite, because people have argued, well, it's a bunch of vascular surgeons, and they kind of did a little half-ass attempt at a superficial femoral uh, occlusion, and then they convert them to bypass. And on the other hand, I think there may have been over-aggression. People are too aggressive with an endovascular approach, burn some of these collateral vessels, and the next thing you know, you've got an unsalvageable limb. Did you have any feeling for that, or how do you well, unravel that? Let me just tell you that um, we're, we're just beginning this exploration of this trial. So what you see is the top-line results and I totally agree that, you know, that's just, Mehdi, you're right. The top line results aren't, don't tell the whole story. We need to get, dig, dig into all the data and, and, and unpack the trial. Um, and hopefully we'll get to the answer about that. That's a really good question, John. Uh, Overaggression is not good. Sometimes changing over to do the bypass is the right thing to do. And that's not a bad thing. So one of the bad things about the trial is it said, if you cross over to surgery because you're not doing well with the endo or it's not good, that's a bad thing. I mean, we, that's the right thing to do at a certain time. Right. And um, it discouraged doing that, um, you know, and it also probably encouraged people to enroll patients who are really lousy endo candidates where you wouldn't do that in the first place. So, you know, this, this, um, it's, it's an amazing trial and we just need to unpack it a lot more. We have a lot of data and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of that, you know. And, and that question also, I would say that, you know, one of the things that would be very interesting to learn in addition to the angiographic uh, data that uh, you mentioned, Kenny, uh, because, you know, one of the concerns, and I've been involved in some of these discussions is that, you know, what if you have a 90% stenosis in the pop, you know, like you said, and, you know, and, or in the SFA or something like that, and you feel like you need to treat that, you know, should you take that patient off? And let's say you did an ultrasound and you did have an open, Saphenous, you had a single saphenous vein available. Would you send that patient to bypass? Like without the angiograms, it's very hard, honestly, to put this trial in a context. The other thing I would be very interested in learning is that of the 106 patients that failed, because the difference in the primary endpoint was actually 106 patients, the number of patients that failed was 108. So 108 patients had a failed endo that then ended up with bypass and were considered to have an event. The difference between the two arms was 106 patients. So how many of those 108 patients actually got amputation? Uh, because that would be another thing that may explain 
that you know why there were so many amputations in the endo because I agree with John is that we have always felt like you know listen if you do a good endo and you don't burn your bridges and you're careful you always have surgery you can rely on that on that and going to your point that surgery should not be thought of as a negative thing it will be thought of as something that can rescue you if necessary if your endo fails or if it's not possible the, bur the, br the bridge burning is important, though. I think that's that's important. Actually, that the last comment here, um, Sherling, is actually really disturbing uh, to me. Do, are you yes, reading? I was reading that, and I was trying to paraphrase these questions into one question regarding, you know, what to do with sort of when um, one fails and and like if you do a surgical bypass, um, what generally is your practice? If this, you know, if if one of my bypasses fail, I actually go back and try to find an endo option. Like we've definitely gone back to recanalize native vessels when the bypass failed. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, when the SFA stent fails, we have gone and done an endo procedure. So I don't think one is, hopefully you don't burn bypass. one bridge when you do the other. Um, but I think one thing that trying to sort of take the liberty to put some of these questions together is, you know, I, I agree that it would be great to get some of the angiographic data because so, so many of our patients to these days have like no informalier targets. They have, they have desert foot, for example. And so, um, and that's hard to figure out based without looking at the angiographic data. But I guess a question for Dr. Shishapur, who is into the whole limb flow thing is, do you think these, these results are gonna apply more globally in everyone who has like lack of, um, you know, where they have patent tibials, but there's no informality, there's no pedal vessels, for example. I mean, I think Dr. Eat can probably answer this better than I can, because if we don't have runoff, usually it doesn't pan, pan out well for anyone, whether you're doing endo or you're doing surgical approach. So you need to have reasonable runoff. And honestly, we didn't even discuss basal tonight. And we already over the, over, I mean, talking about making it even more complicated as we are reading basal, which was published in Lancet, as you know, uh, about uh, 10 days ago, which now shows results that are kind of in serious contrast to what we have seen in BEST. Um, so it gets complicated, to be honest with you. And and uh, as Kenny said, you know, I think hopefully we get more data soon yeah. for us to be able to digest. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just say that uh, there's no, um, you know, a desert foot, those patients were probably not enrolled in the trial because they they had to be a good surgical candidate. And usually that meant that there was a target um, so, it, it, you know, but that's a problem for all of us to deal with it, Sherling. Right. Yeah. I think there's always there's always going to be challenging patients. The, the whole CLI population is one huge group of challenging patients for <laughs> all of us as a collaborative group, right? Um, so I think I, I agree with Dr. I This was a fantastic study. I talked to Alec Farber many times about this over the years that we were enrolling in it. And um you, you could see the angst in his face and then just the general <laughs> relief when we were coming to a close. So I mean, I think it was amazing. You, Dr. Rosenfeld and Alex Farber and Matt Menard really just, it was a tremendous effort and a, it's a fantastic result that I think we all should be yeah. proud of and um, sort of participating in. Um, it has probably generated more questions than answers. And I think everyone is uh, anticipating all the extra data that we can get out of this. Um, so now that we are six minutes over, uh, I just want to thank everyone for um, participating in this tonight, all of our panelists. Sorry, our can, I, can I ask one question? Yeah. Can I ask one last question? I'm so sorry. And because we have one of the PIs, so I think this is a very appropriate because I have had a number of people that have reached out to me and they're like, Mehdi, how do we get our hands on some of this data? And I'm like, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I've been debating these guys for six years. They hate me. So don't ask me, you know, <laughs> so, Kenny, how can people get their hands on this data? Well, is it I possible? Think, and what do you suggest for folks that are interested to ask good questions? So first of all, it's NIH trial. So ultimately the data will be available. Our data set will be available for the public. Um, and that's actually important, but it's not, not until we actually have a chance to explore it. And, you know, honestly, for for those who were participating in one way or another, you can apply, there's a way, there's a publications committee. We hope to, we we have funding for a dissemination, exploration of the data, digging into the data, and, and it's incredibly complex. It's really challenging, but we are now uh, fielding, you know, um, 
requests for proposals. And the one thing I would just say, you know, is I think it's a, the, and it's pointed out by, as you point out by the Basel II trial, that uh, what the one thing that disturbs me more than anything else is over-interpretation of this trial. And, um, you know, as a PI, I feel on the, I'm, I'm, you know, I have to support the trial. Um, and every time I, anytime I say something about limitations, I get, I get the, well, you know, I can't believe you, this is science. You're, you're, you're not supporting the trial. I am supporting the trial. I think we need to be careful not to overinterpret. We need to uh, understand it's patient by patient, operator by operator, quite frankly. And this huge, you know, we, we just need to be very careful. And that, that last comment about uh, somebody saying that they, that their surgical colleagues proceed with amputation if open bypass is not an option, instead of referring for an endovascular intervention. That's not the message of this trial. That is absolutely not. We need to work as a team together to optimize the results of these patients. Thanks, thanks for saying that. I think more of the PIs we hear, more nuance is, are the inferences of the trial. So I think your comment to that uh, question is very appropriate and thanks for saying that. So I will take Appropriately, I think Dr. Rosenbaum gets the closing remark for this because he is the national PI. I, I won't take you, keep you any longer. Um, CME information is on the website and the recording is on the website too if you want to relive this wonderful last hour. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we will see you at the meeting in person in Austin. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Fantastic.